So welcome back, everybody. That was a short break of five minutes. Uh, we have our second talk of the day uh, next. It's going to be a talk by Raul Lejano that's uh, called Narrative and Climate, Relational Perspectives on Communication. So I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Lejano. Um, Raul Lejano is a professor in the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education and Human Development at New York University. He does research in social policy, environmental, gov environmental governance and qualitative social research and narrative analysis whose foremost interests involve understanding people's deep engagements with community and environment and reflected in how we design policy and institutions from a relational perspective. His research suggests strategies for reforming environmental governance around an ethic of care, beginning with his first book, Frameworks for Policy Analysis, Merging Text and Context. He has developed approaches for integrating multiple analytical lenses in interpreting environmental situations. In his co-authored book, The Power of Narrative in Environmental Networks, a theory is advanced regarding the unique capacity of narrative to capture complex human motivations and human-non-human -human relationships. The theory is further developed in his co-authored book, The Power of Narrative, Climate Skepticism, and the Deconstruction of uh, Science. So this is just to let you know that uh, Dr. Lejano is open to accept questions during his talk and actually encourages uh, this kind of interaction. So if you want to raise your hand at any point in the talk, you can do that. And I will uh, let uh, Dr. Lehano know. So welcome, uh, Professor Lehano. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. You can hear me OK? Uh, yes. Thank you, Fernanda. And so um, before I share my PowerPoint, um, I, I'm, I'm going to share my screen and the PowerPoint. Uh, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about the background of the work. But also at some point, I'd like to have a short discussion with people. And uh, so I, I'm told you have to raise your hand and Fernanda will unmute you. And uh, it'd be nice to hear your voice. Um, voices, you know, anything to make a connection. Um, so anyway, this just a kind of, um, I, I see that this panel uh, is about um, the First Nations and most of my talk will be talking about climate skepticism or climate denial, but maybe towards the end, and if we have a discussion at the end, we can get to communities and First Nations. Um, but where I'm coming from is I, um, I'm echoing a little bit of what uh, I believe Baruch Fischoff said uh, last week, that the behavioral sciences should be uh, have a more central role in climate science work and climate advocacy. In fact, I might put it more broadly that social scientists should have a, a more important role, not just we social scientists, but the humanities too. Surely they have an important part to play. Uh, so uh, my work, especially the last few years, has been, uh, been building a thesis of what I call relationality. The, the idea is that the problems that we have in the world, especially with the global commons, uh, comes about when people are alienated or disconnected from the other. And by other, I mean some other person experiencing something who's different from you, but, but in, in, uh, essentially is the same as you, but we see the differences before we see the sameness. And so the disconnect is what causes many of the problems that we see. The flip side of that is that reconnection arouses in each one of us, hopefully empathy, which leads to pro-social, pro-environmental behavior. And so I'm finishing up a book on this uh, entitled uh, A Relational Perspective on Collective Actions with Cambridge Press. It, it's come out, it's gonna come out early next year. But the idea being, uh, the idea of relationality is a play in world, words uh, as opposed to rationality, the, the rational ideal of uh, Cartesian cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Well, relationality starts with a different premise, that of I care, therefore I am. We are naturally caring individuals. But institutions and cultures create obstacles to making this connection. So, um, for example, 
in the uh, class I teach at NYU, I, uh, one of the classes I teach, I start the class, <clears throat> the semester really, with a question, how do we get busy New Yorkers or busy city dwellers from Montreal to care about melting glaciers? And, um, you know, we go through this question, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I spoke with a teacher in Philadelphia not long ago. This is his solution. You know what I did, Raul, he told me. I was having a class. We're talking about climate change, melting glaciers. And we, we Skype a call into a fellow class, a fellow teacher and his class in Tibet. And they started talking on the other end about melting glaciers, their experience with it, the problems that they have in their community with it. And he said, and I'm looking at my students, all of a sudden, in that you know, blink of an eye, melting glaciers becomes the most important thing to them. So with connection, we develop empathy, we get a chance to share perspectives. Um, there's actually a company called Empatico that does this. If you want to hook up your classroom with something with another classroom halfway around the world, they set it up for you. So, so the thesis is that connection enables empathy with the other, which enables collective action, pro-environmental action. The book I'm gonna talk about today is the flip side of this, which is sometimes connection becomes impossible. I am reminded of this, this is gonna be before your many of this, students before your time, you know, Alan. Decades ago, John Lennon wrote this album about um, walls and bridges. That was the title of the album. So the thesis of my co-authored book is that it's the stories that we tell that are the walls and bridges that either divide or connect. It's the power of narrative to bridge and to divide. So let's see, let me uh, share my uh, PowerPoint now. Share screen, share sound. So just some um, references to share with you on which I base uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I'm gonna email some of these to uh, Melissa to share with you, but a couple of um, books uh, on narrative. Um, no need to rush out and get the book, don't worry. If you're ever interested in any chapters, email me. I'll send you the chapters. Um, don't tell the press I said that. And a couple of articles also on narrative. And um, a couple of concepts before we talk about climate from narratology. So we're going to talk about applying narratology to the study of whatever you're studying today, or we're studying climate skepticism. So a couple of concepts, emplotment, and I'm drawing here from uh, Paul Ricure. It's about <clears throat> configuring disparate things, events, agents, objects, people, places, and connecting them into a meaningful whole. So otherwise they're disconnected things, a plot of a story connects them into a meaningful whole. There's the idea of plurivocity, which is we tell, if we're part of a group, a storytelling group, we can tell basically the same story, but in our own way. You know, that uh, the short story, Rashomon, it was the same story, but everybody kept telling it in a, in a slightly different way. And so, but still, you belong to the same narrative network. And uh, intertextuality, this is, if you have a text and it could be, you know, IPCC report, to, to correctly interpret the meaning of that text, we have to realize the meaning of the text derives from other texts before and behind it and in front of it. This is from Julia Kristeva. <clears throat> and that's how we interpret meaning of text. We're talking about text after all. So, um, okay, here, maybe we have to unmute people because I want to try this exercise with you as an example of intertextuality. You know, um, 
I use the term climate skepticism. Others, many others use climate denial. So the idea, the word denial, just a little bit of text, the word denial brings in other texts, other ideas that are not really part of the text that you're reading. You're reading about some climate advocates article, but the mention of the word denial brings other allusions to other texts. And so if somebody wants to share with us their ideas, what other texts or other meanings are imported into the term climate denial when you use the word denial? I mean, it's an easy one. Anybody? Well, you have to raise your hand and then uh, Fernanda will. Well, some people uh, are writing in the chat. Valerie says controversies. Kate, Sharon says Holocaust denial. Well, okay. tell us more about the Holocaust and what does that do? What okay. text is it? What, what is the story being imported into this one? Kate, do you want to raise your hand? Or maybe, you know, actually speak. You, you feel, feel free to speak. Uh, she doesn't have audio like I, I allowed you. Oh, she doesn't have audio. Maybe she doesn't have audio in her computer at all. Uh, but okay, you, can, so. you can write down if you want to like, uh, get, like uh, go in depth and what you were saying about. Holocaust. Well, anybody, uh, you know, so what let's say. So what other stories are important to this one? And uh, good point. You said um, the Holocaust narrative, etc. So what does that say about what is the meaning then of climate denial when we import into that phrase those other stories that you correctly pointed out in your chats? What, what meaning is being imparted by using the word denial? Mahold says destruction. Yes. Someone else? Why would somebody put the word denial in the, yes, destruction, of course. Okay, if you we, have, the, we have a raised hand, so I'm going to open the mic for Constantinos. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I would also say that uh, there, there lies uh, within some kind of an objective truth and someone who denies it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, good. And uh, so what is the purpose? of importing a story about the Holocaust, because that's what, you know, what you've been pointing out. When you use the word denial, yeah, and I'm getting you to say more about that. Uh, it, it alludes to the Holocaust story. Why would you allude to that? Oh, it's hard to manage this thing with Zoom. Yeah, this is, uh, but, but uh, let yeah, me, uh, yeah. So yeah. huge. I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying, but it, it's true that because they cannot just open it whenever. But uh, someone has like um, uh, asked, raise her hand. So Hugh, go ahead. Um, I would say the denial is kind of like trying to contextualize it against uh, in in a way that kind of undermines whatever argument is being brought forward. Um, yes. Using another another context, let's say. Yeah, undermining the argument. And the other context that you're importing into it is the Holocaust story, right? I think that was your, what you're saying, Hugh. Yeah, so you take another, another context, which is not necessarily related in terms of the, the facts, but in terms of the uh, response to the message, it's the same response. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what intertextuality does. It lets you import the other context into the context of this present story. In the turn, in the case of uh, the word climate denial, well, as you know, you're kind of alluding to, you import the other context, which is the Holocaust story, into climate denial. And what is it saying? It's saying those people denying climate are like those denying the Holocaust. And they're saying it's this big moral tragedy. And so the use of the word denial by climate advocates is like saying it's that kind of a moral transgression when you deny climate science. See what I'm saying? So the meaning of climate, the meaning of the text imports into it other texts. And that's how we interpret the meaning of something. So with me so far? 
So yeah, good. so okay. we had some people that were going in that direction in the chat. Clement was saying Holocaust denial discredits the denier with all the weight of an awful history. Some yes, that's were, right. Yeah. So that's exactly that's right. Yeah, well, in fact, you said it better than I did. So so that's what chats are for. And Mahalo in the chat is asking, can this intertextual import ever be systematically unearthed? Yes, that's what uh, we're talking about now. How do you do analysis to unearth it? So that's what we do, narrative and discourse analysis. Yeah, yeah, good, good, uh, good to start thinking about that. So let's start talking about narrative analysis. Why would we do it? Here's why we do it. Here's a, a figure from my um, other book on um, environmental networks. And this was, I was working with a scholar named Helen Ingram, wanting to study conservation in the Arizona, Mexico region. And the question there is, you know, for decades, there've been people on the border region between Arizona and Mexico working together without pay, many of them, to conserve the habitat, jaguars, et cetera, pinacotis, that's a very special environment, it's a desert. And the question she wanted to find out about is, why do they do it? They persist despite many failures. So here's a typical network analysis. You've seen this before, social network analysis, a network diagram. So we had a, uh, you know, a graduate student do it who had better skills than we did. She came up with this and I spoke with Helen and we said, so what does this mean, Helen? And she said, well, I don't know. I thought you would. Well, neither of us don't know what to do with a picture like this. How do you use this to say, to answer why does this group persist? By the way, some sociologists are better with it. They can actually draw meaning from this, uh, you know, this kind of modern art, postmodern art. But, but for us, it was hard to use. So instead, we map the network with narrative. This is what the map looks like. Uh, mapping narrative simply means interviewing people and getting stories from them. And the stories tell us why the group persists, what draws them to this issue. So one of the things that draws them to the issue is simply the place identity relationship. So let me just very quickly point to some of these narratives. One was talking about it becomes touchstones for my soul. These giant cacti, lava flows, et cetera, wildflower color, they all speak to me. And they're talking about their first encounter with the desert. And the second person said, I first came in 1980, it was 50 degrees centigrade. My spirit, however, burned not from the heat, but from this, the fire of this wide open wilderness. I was seduced by this wonderful land. So the narrative tells us one of the things that connects them all together in the network, and it's not part of the network diagram, was the power of the place. The other thing, if you look at the network, uh, the, the narratives that drew them together was mentorship. There were these, at certain points in time, mentors who work, worked with people, walked them through the desert, sharing their familiarity with the desert, and sharing the place with them. So it became a mythical place full of wonders because somebody else shared the magic of the place with them. And so this helps us understand what binds the network together, what keeps it going. And so this draws me to um, the present topic, which is the book on uh, uh, narrative analysis. Where's my clock? Yeah. Okay. Um, narrative analysis, which is about studying climate skepticism. It's the, um, again, oh, and then there's this picture of uh, the ark and the, the other shepherds uh, commenting on Noah. Well, anyway, this uh, book was co-authored with Shondell Nero. And our question here was, what fuels the climate skeptical network? It's a network. And they're very vigorous, they're very strong, especially in the US. What keeps the network going? What keeps them connected? 
and what keeps the, the movement alive. Because at least in the US, especially in the US, they're able to mount a challenge to climate scientists on a matter that's ostensibly a matter of science. How do you do that? You know, fighting against a scientist on a matter of science. Well, climate skeptics, skeptics have somehow been able to forge a counter movement. How? So that's the question for the book. Okay, again, um, reminding you of my central thesis of my work the last five years, maybe 10 years. Connectedness uh, creates empathy, which creates collective thinking and action. And disconnectedness creates antipathy, which creates collective problems, tragedies of the commons. And um, the problem that we have with climate uh, action is that we've developed these communities that are talking past each other. The disconnectedness creates antipathy. And so instead of forging a resolve to move forward, they're ending up in kind of um, conflict, debate. And uh, this only makes it more difficult to move forward. So um, let me, the, the main question for the book is, how was the skeptical community able to do this, to counter the claims of the scientific community? And answers that you have in the literature from uh, Oreskes, et cetera, um, Diley, uh, Riley Dunlap, Etc. is well, there's a lobbying, Koch brothers, etc., especially in the US, conservative parties and conservative think tanks. A lot of money is going into countering the climate science narrative. Uh, where we come in, Shandel Nero and I, where we come in is we add another part of it is the power of the narrative, the power of the climate skeptical narrative. So let me show a quick, very quick illustration of this. I'll show a very quick video. Uh, okay, I have it here, bear with me. Windows Media Player, okay. Or did in the past. I've often heard it said that there is a consensus of thousands of scientists on the global warming issue and that humans are causing a catastrophic change to the climate system. Well, I am one scientist and there are many that simply think that is not true. Man-made global warming is no ordinary scientific theory. This morning, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made up of... It is presented in the media as having the stamp of authority of an impressive international organization. From the IPCC. The, the United Nations Panel. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The IPCC, like any UN body, is political. The final conclusions are politically driven. This claim that the IPCC is the world's top 1,500 or 2,500 uh, scientists. You look at the bibliographies of the people and it's simply not true. There are quite a number of non-scientists. And to build the number up to 2,500, they have to start taking reviewers and government people and so on, anyone who ever came close to them. And none of them are asked to agree. Many of them disagree. Those people who are specialists but don't agree with the polemic and resign, and there have been a number that I know of, uh, they are simply put on the author list and become part of this 2,500 of the world's top scientists. People have decided you have to convince other people that since no scientist disagrees, you shouldn't disagree either. Uh, but that, whenever you hear that in science, that's pure propaganda. This is the story of how a theory about climate turned into a political ideology. See, I don't even like to call it the environmental movement anymore because really it is a political activist movement and they have become hugely influential at a global level. It is the story of the distortion of a whole area of science. Climate scientists need there to be a problem in order to get funding. We have a vested interest in creating panic because then money will flow to climate science. <laughs> 
there's one thing you shouldn't say, and that is, this might not be a problem. It is the story of how a political campaign turned into a bureaucratic bandwagon. Fact of the matter is that tens of thousands of jobs depend upon global warming right now. It's a big business. It's become a great industry in itself. And if the whole global warming farrago collapse, there'll be an awful lot of people out of jobs and looking for work. This is a story of censorship and intimidation. I have seen and heard there spitting fury at anybody who might disagree with them, which is not the scientific way. It is a story about Westerners invoking the threat of climatic disaster to hinder vital industrial progress in the developing world. One clear thing that emerges from the whole uh, environmental debate is the point that uh, there's, there's somebody keen to kill the African dream, and the African dream is to develop. The environmental movement has evolved into the strongest force there is for preventing development in the developing countries. The global warming story is a cautionary tale of how a media scare became the defining idea of a generation. The whole global warming business has become like a religion. And uh, people who disagree are called heretics. I'm a heretic. Uh, the makers of this program are all heretics. So, um, oh, by the way, if anybody wants to comment, please raise your hand and then uh, feel free to say something now. How does the narrative have work? Questions? Do you want me yeah. to read them to you or? Okay, uh, sure, sure. Uh, so, they were, I think it's not exactly referring to the video, it's a little before the video. So mm. once uh, Clement, Clement Mangin asks, uh, when the, for the first pause, when we were talking about the, the, the concept of denial and the meaning behind using the word denial, he's asking, uh, is indeed a trial of intent to claim that mobilizing the concept of, de of denial equals to drawing a possibly false equivalence? Well, that's, yeah, that's our analysis. We show, we interpret what other meanings are, are drawn into this text that we're reading about, let's say, climate denial. And we can critique it. My work, by the way, I don't say if it's good or bad. Is it good or bad to use the word denial? I just analyze it and I reserve the um, normative discussion for maybe the end, or maybe I don't even get into it at all. In the book, Although at the end, I say, well, really, it's your opinion, by the way. And alone, let me tell you what to think about it. But there's something about drawing a parallel between the Holocaust and climate denial that is injure, injurious to skeptics. People, and I'm not talking about Trump, et cetera. You know, Trump, Tony Abbott, they know they're lying. But I'm talking about members of the public who really are skeptical about climate science. And to equate that with Holocaust deniers is really doing injury to them. I know people who are skeptical and they are, you know, decent, intelligent people. I spoke with one and, uh, not so long ago. So you can interpret, you know, you, uh, your analysis can include the normative. We don't in our book. We just interpret. Whether anyone wants to, yes. And we have one more uh, about this idea of connectedness, creating empathy, and creating a collective feeling in, in action. Uh, Mao says, uh, Zizek proposes that connectedness actually creates antipathy, antipathy, because differences cannot be resolved if there's less mystery and less space in between agents. Um, well, I don't know, but personally, you don't bank your whole philosophy on Zizek. It's just, uh, you know, some authors try to sound radical, but you have to be kind of, um, you know, sensible too, that 
And you look at the evidence, you look at the evidence, you know, when people feel a connection, by the way, can create animosity. You know, we see that all the time. But when I talk about connection, there's a way to connect where people see each other eye to eye and they see the other. There's a way to connect people that they don't see the other, to see the other. Uh, as Levinas talked about, there's a risk there. You can kill the other or you can accept and embrace the other. There are situations that allows for embrace. Um, okay, anybody want to comment on the video? How does narrative work to create a network of believers? Feel free to raise your hand or write in the chat, whatever works best. Was it good? Did you like it? Was it bad? We have another hand, good. Clement, yes. you want to comment? Yes. Um, well, what I, what I found fascinating is that they uh, bring talking points uh, from uh, the past where we saw that science uh, debunked religion and uh, they uh, pass for heretics in front of the Catholic Church and they uh, take this uh, narrative for themselves. And it's brilliant, I think. Mm. Yeah. So, um... So you see this kind of uh, drawing into the idea of heresy, et cetera. So this is the way how narrative works. And again, yes, it's propaganda, it's selective, et cetera, selective textuality, but it works by creating a compelling story and it draws people to it and catches them and holds on to them. It works by creating a sequence of events instead of like an IPCC report, oh, everything's there, blah. No, a story builds up, it introduces characters, it introduces the plot, it uses a David and Goliath trope. And if it's successful, it will arouse catharsis. And use, the, the viewer starts to become enraged, just like the narrator is enraged. Next thing you know, yeah, this is a grand conspiracy. So the point here is, how does it work? The power of narrative. We know it works because there are millions of Americans who truly believe in it. And again, I'm gonna make the caveat. I'm talking about American, mainly the, Amer the US context, not even the Canadian context, because most of our examples were from the US. Although in our book, we have a chapter on other nations, but let me just talk about the US now. Such a uh, nice example. We have one more question uh, from Hugh White uh, related to this, uh, the power of narrative in this particular example. And he asks, would you say that narrative creation which relies upon somewhat unrelated contexts, such as climate change and the Holocaust, is a misleading means to develop tailored emotional responses and therefore inappropriate? Okay. What is appropriate? What is inappropriate? Yes. Um, again, it's your subjective belief. Uh, you, it's up to you. To, but in my book, in the, at the end of it, we say, we believe this is actually a moral trespass upon people who really are skeptical about climate, you know? And so, but uh, that's how narrative works. When we analyze narrative, uh, I, I bracket away judgment on, is this right to do this narrative or wrong? First, I analyze how good is this narrative? Why is it good? And then we can move on. Towards the end, you can go back to, oh, this narrative is so wrong, it's immoral. But the, the narrative analysis itself is aided if you can bracket judgment for towards the end of your analysis. Um, the analysis combines narrative and discourse analysis. The narrative analysis is mainly about tracing the evolution of plot and storyline over time. For example, if you look at the plot, uh, the narrative of climate denial, it's been changing over time. At some point, about you know, 15, 20 years ago, a theme emerged that you know, climate has always been changing. But, but, uh, and then other themes emerge. And so tracing that over time is interesting. We not just trace the plot, we also look at the language. Because if you just write the plot, maybe you have the same basic plot over the last 20 years, but um, the language conveys changes in meaning. 
you know, when they start talking about exaggeration and then a few years later, they use the word conspiracy, that changes the meaning of the story. And so what the book did, at least chapter three, we looked at uh, op-eds written in, you know, for example, you can look at this uh, conservative website. They have a magazine, Environment and Conservation. And they've been doing this magazine over the last 25 years. Well, we analyze the narratives in the op-eds in that magazine over 25 years and just see how did the story change over time? And here is the, the thesis that the book is trying to, um, to persuade you, the, the reader, about. The narrative and the network of climate skeptics, they are two sides of the same coin. What drives the network comes from the narrative. And um, the properties of the narrative are found in the properties of the network. So for example, the network is insulated from other groups. They're just, they're talking to each other. They don't talk to groups outside them. They don't talk to climate advocates. Well, part of that is enabled by properties in the narrative. We call it autopoiesis. I'll talk about that in a while. So there are there are properties in the, in the narrative, autopoiesis, decontextualization, invariance, saturation, literary properties in the narrative that feed into the network. I'll give you an example. Well, first of all, um, give me, let me look at this. First, the idea of saturation. Saturation is when you find in a narrative that the thing that you're talking about is then generalized to every other domain. So a very ideological kind of narrative makes a point and says this point applies to every place, every people, every time. And so, for example, here's a snippet from one of the op-eds. In a world threatened by the rise of radical Islamism, by the outbreak of disease, et cetera, and other actual problems to be addressed. The notion that thousands of have the belief that they and the rest of the Earth's population have any effect of climate is appalling. So this is an example of saturation. Why? They're talking about climate uh, science. Um, they're talking about climate, and yet the points they're making are so easily conflated into talking about Islamism, talking about infectious disease, everything else. So when the issue that you're talking about is something you can generalize into something global encompassing everything, this is when you see that the narrative is becoming uh, saturated. It's becoming this universal story that applies everywhere. And here's another example um, down there, no need to. Well, let me rush on because of the time. The claim in the chapter in the book is that over the last 20 years, the climate skeptical narrative has become more and more of a closed ideology. To trace this, we look at the properties of the narrative that we show on the left and show that it's increasing over time until it becomes a hardened ideology that's so closed that its believers don't talk to anybody else. They just have the story. They don't refer to science anymore. So here's an example, if you have a minute. Um, the, on the left is a snippet of an op-ed from 2001, and on the right is one from 2012. If you take a minute and read the passage on the left, and then look at the uh, similar op-ed from the same author, I think, on the right, 11 years later, what is the difference in the two narratives? So on the left, he's talking about the hockey stick graph. Uh, been rising in the last thousand years, but if you look at the margin of error, Lindzen says you can no longer maintain that statement, okay? On the right, talking about fake gate, et cetera. Um, well, you can read it. So Maot is asking if uh, the difference is the reliance on authority. Whose authority? Maybe she can, um, scientific authority. Okay, good. Yeah, I agree. Anybody else? 
Okay. So let me uh, touch on that point by Mahmoud. On the left, we see a greater reference to scientific authority. It's a dismissal of it, but it references it. You know, Lindzen talks about the science and refutes it, but talks about it. On the right, they don't even talk about the science anymore. So this is what we call autopoiesis. More and more over time, the narrative is more and more isolated from the other, right? This is my thesis, isolation from the other, the other being the climate science. In the beginning, at least they talked about the other and referenced it. But as you went over time, they more and more became more isolated. At the end, if you, talk, you look at today, they don't even talk about the science anymore. So we see over time um, that it became more and more ideological. And this is what my co-author Shondell did. She looked at narratives over five periods of time, the first President Bush, second President Bush. And again, this is admittedly mainly a US example. Obama first term, Obama second term, and Trump. And this is what she found doing the narrative analysis. And I'm just showing, no need to read this, but this is how she did her um, analysis or discourse analysis. It's like uh, thematic classification. You get the narrative and you separate these, find these different themes. If you want to color code them, and then you summarize what themes emerge in period one, two, three, four, five. And this is what we came up with in the, the first uh, four years, et cetera. The talk, the climate skeptical narrative was about the science is unsettled. They are being alarmist, the scientists. You get to the second period, it changes a little bit. Not only is it unsettled, but you know, it's even false. The climate has always been changing. And the scientists and the advocates are imposing their moral agenda on us, not science, it's about morality. Period three, it comes even more trenchant, more severe. You know what they're doing? This is a hoax, it's a scam for financial gain. This is where it came in around that period around period four, the narrative, it doesn't change, it just adds, it builds to it. In the period four, it added to it this idea that these are global elites trying to control our lifestyles. Right? They're trying to control our very lives, how we barbecue, how we drive our cars, et cetera. And then in period five, because Trump came along in the US, then the, the it had a kind of a triumph in the narrative. Oh. We were right all along. Our narrative has been legitimized. We withdrew from the Paris Accord, et cetera. An example of this too is if you look at the Bjorn Lomborg's famous book from 20 plus years ago, and you look at his recent book, the title you know, gives you a sense of how the narrative has changed from simply being skeptical about the science to, okay, these people are, it's a hoax. Okay, uh, so okay with that so far? That over time, the narrative became more and more severe, more and more isolated from the other, and that created an, a network that became more and more ideological, less able to, to maintain a conversation, became more, uh, you know, like the group of people that stormed the Capitol in January, the US Capitol. Okay, let me make a quick detour, make a quick, um, tour of another chapter in our book, which we is talking about- We have one technical uh, question. Should I read it Yes, to you? yes, uh, So please. Mao is asking in terms of methodology, he says on the discourse analysis, it feels like this process could be automated with softwares like word to back Is this how you proceeded? No, uh, some people do, but I don't because interpretation, the computer can't interpret um, so well, but it, the computer can organize the text and and make the connections between different texts. But at the end, I rely on the human to interpret and say, what is the plot that comes out of all of this? What is the meaning of drawing the Holocaust story into the reaction to climate skepticism? So um, if any, um, if interested in the method, I'll be sharing some files um, with Melissa. 
So I jumped to another chapter just because it's interesting to share with you. Chapter five was talking about underlying meta narratives. The question for this chapter is different. The question was, how was the climate skeptical narrative maintained with such a diverse group of people? And this drew people from all sorts of uh, walks of life, and they're all gathering under the climate skeptical bandwagon. Well, for this, we drew from a uh, narratologist, mainly Vladimir Prop. Let me just stay in a quick second, talk about Prop studied uh, hundreds of Russian folktales. And when he looked at all these hundreds, he said, you know what? I can take all of them and condense them to a small number of storylines. They all draw from like five, six, seven, I think he said 10 basic storylines. And they use the same plot over and over again, but in different ways, makes it a little bit interesting, but it's all based on the same plot. A lot of them are. So we take this, um, how do you structure a plot? We use the model from Grimas. Uh, but uh, let me jump to the next slide just to make the point. We took stories from different issues. On the left is we took a story from climate denial op-eds. And on the right, we took a story from an anti-immigration article. The point here is when we look at the structure of the plot, we can make the point that there actually is the same plot, just like what Vladimir Prop showed about the Russian folktale. It's the same plot, in one case, interpreted in terms of carbon. On the right side, interpreted in terms of anti-immigration, but it's the same basic plot. Here is the, here is the plot. Um, and we call it the genetic meta-narrative. Uh, the plot is not about climate. It's not about, the, it's more basic than, than climate. It's, if you read it, while we once felt sure of our place in the world, now we're being told that our ways are wrong. Others are imposing their morality and their lifestyles on us, taking away the control we have over our communities. They oppose us because they're alien to us. They hate us. This basic plot is common to people who are in the climate uh, skeptical group, anti-immigration, uh, guns, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea is it draws people together, not so much because, you know, what they think about climate science, but because it draws on a basic plot that is about societal fracture. People, I'm talking again about the U.S., in the heartland of the U.S. feel, they feel alienated from these times. They feel like they're... Um, being put on up by, by the rest of society. And so the two points that this chapter is making is that climate skeptical narrative was never about the science to begin with. So what a lot of advocates are trying to do, and of course they have to try to do this, this is not wrong, which is to keep citing better and stronger science. But they have to realize for some, it was, it was never about science to begin with. So better science, more science, doesn't remove climate skepticism. The second point being, this is why different people uh, get to join the same coalition. They share a same basic common plot. Um, okay, I wanted to make one more point from this book and I'll make it very quickly. There's something about narrative that draws people together and draws them into a network. It's stronger, the more ideological the narrative is. And we showed some properties that create for a very ideological narrative. There's an interesting thing happening. Climate advocates and scientists are also exhibiting ideological talk. If you read this uh, climate, uh, I forget this website, but it's debunking climate denial you look at the language in that website, it's taking on aspects of ideology. And this is talking about Judith Curry's uh, climatologist, but the way they're critiquing Curry has gone from critiquing the ideas to critiquing ad hominem, the person. 
well, this is ideology. You're not referencing the evidence anymore. You're just referencing the narrative. Perhaps this is a good place to take um, uh, comments, you know, questions, et cetera. Uh, let me stop at this slide and, um, and maybe people have something to share or ask? Uh, yeah, we already have a couple questions in the chat. Yes, yes. So first one uh, is from Clement, uh, who says, doesn't the accusation go both ways, meaning that the science of climate scientists uses roughly the same strategies to discredit deniers that the deniers use to discredit scientists? I think you, you were just making a comment related to this. Yeah, good um, point. That's the point of this slide. So by pointing biases in funding, ideological influences, etc. Uh, I mean, the Environmental Science Institute at UCAM is filled with watermelon environmentalists. I am one, admittedly. <laughs> Deniers aren't exactly wrong. There are studies critical of social psychology and its biases against conservatives as well, for instance. Well, the point um, we're trying to make in the book, and responding to your point too, is that there is a way to conduct discourse in public that connects and creates dialogue, and there's a way that disconnects. And the way the dialogue, there's no dialogue going on now. The narratives, and, you, and again, I'm pointing to narrative on the other side, the climate scientists and the advocates. It is disconnecting. It's not encouraging dialogue. Using these tropes, war, good and evil, et cetera, calling people Holocaust deniers. It is discouraging dialogue. There is a way to encourage talk, even across the divide. So that's the point. Of, and I think there's a point the comments we're making too. I see, thank you so much. We have another one uh, from Maho who asks, what to do with the narratives around climate protection in alternative health communities, which are now merged with conspiracy theories, which deny climate change. And Lewandowski uh, in his talk, uh, I think uh, on Friday showed that these worldviews tend to correlate, uh, meaning the, alternative health communities and conspiracy theories. Uh, and also another speaker we had, Van der Linden, showed that they tend to lead into one another. Uh, so if, uh, he, she's asking if you have any insight on how these two narratives coalesce without dissonance. They coalesce from the previous slide. They share the same meta narrative. The meta narrative is not about climate, it's not about COVID, et cetera. It's about people feeling alienated. And, and then it just gets translated in these different issue areas, climate, COVID, et cetera. And one way to approach that is to go back to this, the basic alienation that people are experiencing. Part of the alienation is that, you know, first of all, we academics, and you know, you know I guess me included at some point, just call these people, you're evil. You don't get a conversation that it only reinforces the other's feeling of being alienated. How do we create a conversation that goes in two ways, that we have a conversation? It has to come with the change in the language. That's why in this book, we don't use the word denial. There are people, sincere people, who really are skeptical about climate. I'm not going to say that they're anti-Semitic. So, you know, this is a moral trespass. And so we have to encourage dialogue. And by the way, before people say, oh, you're just encouraging climate skepticism. I'm a professor for environmental education. So, you know, look at me. Right? This, uh, we're, we want to achieve the same thing here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more in the chat and then I'm gonna uh, open the mic for Valérie who wants to ask a question uh, yeah. through voice. So um, there is a public, the question reads, there is a public inquiry commissioned by the government of Alberta into foreign anti-Albertan anti energy activism and movements which engage with environmental disc discourse. Uh, how, so, yeah, okay, okay, sorry. I, I did, didn't read with the correct intonation. So there is a public inquiry commissioned by the, commissioned by the government of Alberta into foreign anti-Albertan energy activism and movements. However, these engage with environmental discourse. What do you think of this kind of initiative? Well, I don't know the initiatives. I'm sorry, I can't say much more. I wish I understood it. I apologize. 
so ignorant. And we, I'm gonna open the mic for Valerie, who wants to ask a question. Valerie. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, hi. Uh, well, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting and uh, I really like it. Uh, I just wanted to um, clarify, when you say uh, the, the narrative uh, isolate, uh, do you mean that they isolate uh, the, the climate change uh, phenomena? Because in your example, you, uh, I, I felt like uh, during the time, uh, more phenomena were like gathering together like anti-vax or anti-immigration, all of those with the anti-climate change, uh, well, the denial, the, sorry, denial of climate change, I feel like they, they were uh, gathering together in the, in the last example uh, that you showed about the isolated uh, facts. So I wasn't sure where, uh, how does the climate change uh, is isolated? It seems to me that it's more gathered with other phenomena. Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they gather together, but the isolation I'm talking about in the book is isolation from the other narrative, the narrative of climate change, climate science. And so over time, we saw the climate skeptical narrative being less and less referencing the other's narrative. It's becoming self-isolated, you know, self-encapsulated. Okay, okay. So that's what we do. Yeah. Okay. And the, the network itself becomes isolated. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Valerie. Uh, we have another one uh, from Hugh, who asks, mm. how do you feel about the power of narrative? I find it scary that only a few plots can allow for such a great level of coercion and polarization. Well, the power of narrative, is, it is, it's what, what it is in itself. It's how we communicate with each other. It's the way communities form communities is through stories, through narrative. It's what makes part of what makes life beautiful. Otherwise, it would be this jumble of sensory input. And so it's powerful, it's terrible, and it's also beautiful. This is what makes, as Paul Ricure would say, this is what makes our life. The story that we craft with our own lives. It can be beautiful, it can be, it, it can be everything. But you're right. There's a power to it. Thank you. And we have one comment by Alexandria, who says, <clears throat> excuse me, this reminds me of COVID to some degree. At the onset, yes. the discussions in some of my circles were very scientific based in their following and beliefs. They looked at numbers or statistics. Today, some continue to look at the numbers and relate it to the waves we're currently experiencing. However, others focus now on things like COVID only happened to control us. It was just a fool for the government to control. So kind of like exemplifying this change of narrative for from science to, you know, the... Yeah, there's things like responsible narrative versus non-responsible. So what we're pointing to is a responsible way of storytelling is a storytelling that's not isolated from the other stories that you hear. The story that says, well, this is all a conspiracy, the COVID, this is isolated from other stories that talk about data, that talk about the experience of people in Asia. If we can have open storytelling, storytelling that shares with others, even people who disagree with you, this allows for a reflective citizenry. So we have to teach students to be reflective, to be critical. COVID is a good example. We all had to become our own scientists overnight. We had to sift through different conflicting data sometimes and tell our own story. So we have to encourage people to be like that, be reflective, analytical, critical. And for that to happen, they have to be open. They have to listen instead of, okay, I have this blinder. I'm only talking about one thing here and listening to only my group. I see, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, Nicola that raised his hand. So I'm gonna open the mic if that's okay uh, with you. Yes, Nicola. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, thank you for the very interesting speech. It's interesting to thank see you. some classical uh, semiotics such as Ricca or Grimas uh, being put to use in a contemporary uh, setup. Uh, being a daily uh, big reader of like uh, news, like uh, New York Times, European News and uh, elsewhere, 
I kind of see a pattern that uh, many of the conflicting narratives insulating people are rooted in some form of like political right-wing uh, populism. There's like obviously uh, Trump, but also Bolsonaro in Brazil, Narendra Modi in India, Duterte in Philippines, uh, Orban in Hungary, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, do you feel that there is a kind of like um, political over-determination of like deal with those insulating narratives? Because often now, It's being depicted in the media as being like uh, there's this conspiracy about COVID and global elites, but broadly, I feel that they're kind of like generated by many uh, populist right wing movement, kind of like taking a lot of power in the last decade, so to speak. You believe they're they're politically overdetermined. You believe uh, they're eroding the classical liberal uh, public space of debate. Uh, do you feel? What are your prospects on this? Thank you. Yes, yes, and yes. The uh, thing is, narrative and network are two sides of the same coin. They're a dialectic. The narrative is powerful. It created Trump. Trump was a product of this story that kept evolving over 20 years. But the people that come into power also feed the narrative. So the narrative and the network feed each other. And the people come into power, you know, they they use Twitter or whatever, and it helps fuel the narrative. And they they kind of reinforce each other. And yes, we saw the rise of this populist, and populist in a negative term, the rise of a populist narrative the last 10 years. And it's been bad for the world. Yeah. But again, what we need is conversation that allows people to consider, you know, Uh, different narratives to be open to what the other is saying. Thank you so much. I think for now, we don't have more questions in the chat. We have a couple comments like saying, Alexandra says that she likes the idea of responsible storytelling uh, you were mentioning. And Chantal that says that CC narratives need to come with critical thinking uh, as well. And uh, that being said, if you want to uh, continue with your talk, we have 20, 24 more minutes, including uh, time for questions. So. Well, I, I don't want to use up people's time. Yeah, you tell me, are, are people wanting to, uh, I'm kind of finished with my talk. I, if I had one minute, I could show one more slide. Oh, go ahead. I mean, Perfect. I would say just go ahead and I can tell you when we have 10, five minutes left and if there's people that want oh, to interact. Uh, Let me, let me just take one more minute. These are just examples of, you know, I'll share the PowerPoint file with you anyway. Examples of ideological talk on the climate scientist side. Bill McKibben using the war, um, war metaphor to talk about climate change and Michael Mann saying it, uh, using again, the um, Holocaust uh, metaphor. And again, this is ideolo ideological talk uh, being found on all sides of the debate. So, and I wanted to flash um, when one slide maybe for you to take away to start thinking about on your own. If you look at narrative, does it add anything to your own work? When you analyze climate action, climate change uh, issues, does this narrative perspective add anything to your analysis? And a way to start using it, think about now. I talked about the climate skeptical narrative, how it was changing over the last 25 years. Where do you think it's going now? Uh, and particularly, how do you think this pandemic experience is affecting the climate narrative? It's such a universal experience. It has to have an effect on how we think about other things, you know, saturation. These things affect everything else. Oh, uh, I have okay. one last slide. It's a pitch for in case anybody's interested. Uh, my research has to do with environmental communication and I have some work and this is the website. I just wanted to flash it on um, communicating risks in the US, um, Bangladesh, Philippines, and we're going to more countries hopefully the next year but we're just uh, going through new methods of doing risk communication around extreme weather. 
And so to make a long story short, what we're doing here is encouraging storytelling because we found out then when people um, get these technical bulletins, especially, oh, uh, storm surge, six meter storm surge and a forecast with the, you know, hurricane signal number five, a lot of people ignore it. And we find that maybe the solution is the community itself has to be the risk communicator. They have to be empowered to act like experts and to take the information into their communities because otherwise people are not evacuating, ignoring the bulletins. Um, and the point is for them to be risk communicators, we have to use the language of community, which is narrative, translating technical information into everyday narrative. And so we, we practice, we work with communities and they practice in taking a technical bulletin, translating it into a story and telling others in the community about it. So, okay, that's enough on that research. If you had an interest, kindly email me. Thanks, that's all I had. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dehano. We have one raised hand. Uh, so I'm gonna open the mic for Konstantinas. Konstantinas. Hello. Uh, so I found very interesting th this thing that you said uh, just now that uh, the narrative is the language of community. And I was thinking that this uh, time period that you that you described where uh, the, the, this isolation that has uh, taken over uh, in the climate uh, change denial or skepticism to come. Isn't, doesn't it also correspond with the lack of social capital that we have been uh, witnessing a lot? And maybe these yeah. are two interconnected phenomena. It is interconnected, it's a good point. Um, we, we, it requires empowerment of community to have voice. This is where the social capital comes in. When people feel isolated, they have no voice they lash out. And so we, we have to encourage people to, to exert their voice, whatever they believe in, to engage in a dialogue. And in the case of risk communication, in, encourage communities to, be, to communicate knowledge that they have. Instead of just being receiving knowledge, people have to engage in communication. And by the way, this uh, idea of uh, narrative as a language of community comes from Jean-Francois Lyotard in his famous book, The Condition of Postmodernity. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have another uh, raised hand uh, by Roxane Boyer, who first wrote that she thinks it's, it's difficult to inform without scaring people. I'm gonna open the mic for her. Roxane. Yes, uh, this is my point because I'm experiencing that with my friends and uh, families. Uh, with close people that I usually have a good communication. So I can, it's difficult even them to express what I learn without yeah. having rejection of, they are skeptical about where I get those information because the rea reality is so uh, scary that it's even difficult to, to try to make them inform without fearing them and making uh, maybe be open to listen very carefully of what I learn and what I have to share with them. Because usually people, when they seem to be strange, they even question your health, uh, be, uh, well, uh, <laughs> your mental health. Yeah. Well, that's cognitive, cognitive dissonance, isn't it? When something is so scary for some people, then they deny the... Um, the message, because it's hard to really continue going about normal everyday life with it. So we deny the existence of it, but really it's part of it that I have no solutions. I'm, I'm not a counselor. I know nothing about counseling, but part of it is really just having an exchange with people and relating to them, understanding people. And I do this in class. I tell my students, you know, in the end, the story that you tell me is not as important as you're telling the story and us exchanging and our understanding where each other's coming from. And so maybe they end up disbelieving, having a different version of what's happening. But if you have this exchange, 
you have this empathy between mutual others. You know, there's always hope in that. And at some point, you start to see each other eye to eye and understand where the other's coming from. And maybe then, then there's less denial because denial is often a knee jerk reaction. Oh, okay, I look at your face, you're wrong, right? Now, what we get into, we need to have people see each other. Uh, understand each other, never mind if you disagree, you know, withhold the judgment and just have an exchange. Yes, thank you. Be more zen about that you said, that just trying to uh, to exchange. Yeah, uh, and you, you may end up disagreeing, but the worst is, is just total disconnect. People don't communicate anymore. Yes. It just, you know. Thank you. But thank you. Thank you. And while you were speaking, I was thinking about uh, the phenomenon we see more and more in, in, in social media, which are these kind of discussions where people just use like ideological narratives to antagonize the others. It seems like you're part of a team or you're not. And it's very hard to exchange in respect and in openness. I'm wondering if your work has looked at any of that, like narratives in social media, or if this type of communication changes somehow or encourages some type of narratives? No, I haven't, but I think others do, if you look at the communication literature. But, you know, the, yeah, that social media is difficult because it allows for people to unleash their text without a real conversation. You know, you blog, and then somebody blogs an insulting thing back with an emoji. There's no conversation there. And so this is treating the other as this alien other. Conversation requires, and this is at some point, there's something different between digital and face-to-face. Face-to-face, you're in the same room. At some point, you acknowledge the other. You stay there long enough. You can't treat them completely as this you know, alien other. Thank you. And we have another question uh, from Clément, who says, <clears throat> Natural climate science is classically grounded in some form of positivism, while discourse analysis is generally grounded in hermeneutics or an anti-positivist interpretative epistemology, which some consider as unfalsifiable or unscientific. What do you think of these strange interdisciplinary bedfellows? Yes, well, you know, Thomas Kuhn and others Sociologists in science technology studies made the point that, well, really, even science and scientists are a storytelling community. There is interpretation even in science. Because really, what does science work with? They're looking at these things that come out of a machine, and they interpret what they're looking at. So this recognition that even within science, there is interpretation, there is hermeneutics, even semiotics, is a healthy thing. It's not saying that science is false. It's just saying that knowledge is interpreted. And the better we come to grips with that, the better we're able to have a conversation between scientists, social scientists, and those in the humanities. I think uh, Baruch Fischoff made the point that climate advocacy has been hurt by this separating of domains. I'll give you an example from COVID. Right now in the US, the CDC just recently said, you know what, you can stop using masks now, we won. Between you and me, I'm Asian, right? I'm, I'm speaking from Hong Kong. I'm joining you from Hong Kong now. I'm gonna to fly to New York soon. I'm Asian, I'm very comfortable wearing masks. I think if I go to New York, whatever they say, I'll still, still keep wearing my mask. But you know what's gonna happen? There's gonna be a greater fueling of anti-Asian sentiments. There will be people from this part of the world who will go there, wear a mask. They will encounter hostility. Why? Because policymakers don't have enough social science. Not enough, don't hear enough from the sociologists, from anthropologists who have something to add to the conversation. And so, uh, yeah, we're all interpreting communities. Interpre interpretation is a good thing. Thank you for that. And um, I don't know if we have any more questions. If you want to ask oh, someone, uh, Chantal is saying uh, she recommends this book about sympoiesis and response and responsibility. 
Staying with the Trouble, Making Kini the Cthulhu Sen uh, by Donna Haraway. Uh, yes. And then some agreements, hand clap, agreed. I don't know. If, uh, okay, so I think uh, we have time for one last intervention and, and time's up. So Clement, I agree it's a good thing. Uh, the, I guess, so coming back to interdisciplinarity and the social sciences in policy. I agree it's a good thing, but it's being attacked as being unfalsifiable, and it leaves the door open to re relativist attacks. How could we counter them? Countering relativism? Well, you know, if we're critical and analytical and reflective, and we're open to considering even very different points of view, we start to realize some narratives are better than others. Some narratives are patently false. When Trump says he won the election, you know it's false, you know he's lying, but you, you arrive at that because we can tell the better story. The better story resonates with our experience, resonates with the data, resonates with our values. And this requires openness. We can tell, we can tell the better narrative if we are critical and reflective enough. Well, that's my belief. Okay, that's my narrative. Well, thank you very much. And, and with this uh, conclusion, thank I you. think we can finish the session. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lejano.